Welcome back to the Chad Hasty Show. I'm Matt Crow sitting in for Chad, and we're going to get right to the phones. I've got Steve Ministeri on the line, and Steve uh, is fortunately, uh, I, I was able to get a hold of Steve because one of the reasons I wanted to do is he's older than I am, and he's been in Republican politics longer than I have been by about um, eight years. So now I don't feel so old that uh, I got a guy who actually remembers the 76 convention uh, when Ronald Reagan. Um, made a run for it the first time, and of course, then four years later, he was successful. But Steve, welcome to the show. How have you been? Well, it's great that you made me feel feel ancient. And not <laughs> only not only do I remember the 1976 convention, I'm probably one of the few people still alive that I was at the 1976 <laughs> convention as part of the Reagan youth staff. What well, wasn't there was some talk right about a Ford would take Reagan on as a running mate, but that kind of died pretty quickly. My understanding, and this comes from uh, talking to uh, Ray Barnhart, used to be the party chairman, and uh, and I think Mayor Ernie Angelo from Midland, who's still alive, can confirm this, that uh, Ray and Camp put out very early in the convention process uh, that the governor just simply didn't want to be the vice, didn't want to be vice president. So I think Ford folks had that on their mind, but Reagan shot it down pretty quickly. You um, you mentioned the you know the the national convention and, and, and uh, just to let the listeners know, Steve uh, was the chairman of the Republican Party of Texas a couple of terms back, and I have to say I've never met one Republican in Texas who's uh, doesn't remember you finally as as a state chairman. I think that's a that says a lot about your character. Um, so we we just had the national convention by all effective. Uh, means, I guess, canceled, right? I mean, they're going to do a little bit of it in person in Charlotte, but uh, for the most part, it's, it's going to be virtual. How, what do you think that's going to do for or against Trump not having that, that podium the night he accepts the nomination? Well, I'm concerned from more of a broader point of view, and that being that the fewer the, li- the live events, um, the less energy you can generate. You know, you know the the Democrats. The argument would be would face the same problem, but I would argue that Joe Biden's pretty low energy anyway, and I think that uh, it's actually helped the Democrats that Joe Biden doesn't get out there because he's had he's had trouble putting his sentences together. The president attracts huge enthusiastic crowds. And so I'd I'd be lying to you if I told you I didn't think it was a negative that he's not going to be out. He's not going to be able to get out there as much as he used to. But, so how does you know, how does he make that up then? Going down the stretch, uh, is there a way to make it up? There, there are things that you can do um, to mitigate. You can't completely make it up, but they're going to be doing virtual rallies and online events. So the the scope can actually increase. So you, you'll be able to reach more people because you're doing things. Uh, online, so maybe instead of reaching forty thousand people live, you reach four million. So there, there is a mitigation, but there's, there's nothing like being at a Trump rally. I've been live <laughs> at a Trump rally, yeah. and one of the ones that I was fortunate. Uh, your listeners may know this, but I spent two years on the on the on the president's White House staff, and one of the, because I was from Texas when they had the Texas rally, I got to fly on Air Force One and come down to Houston, and that. That before the eighteen election, and and that uh, Toyota Center was just rocking and rolling. So I, I, we're, we're yeah. going to miss that. I've been to one. It was in El Paso. I don't know if you came down for that one or not, but um, I'd never seen anything like it. And I, you know, of course, had worked on and and uh, attended you know dozens of Reagan rallies and and Reagan events, but I'd never seen anything like the Trump rally. I mean, it was a cross between a you know, a, a WWF match and, um, you know, uh, uh, some kind of a, you know, rock band concert. I mean, it was it's unlike anything I'd ever seen where Reagan's was more or less buttoned up and formal and, you know, hail to the chief and people had on suits and so on and so forth. But the, the Trump rallies is, I mean, I was amazed. I'd like, a, you know, and we'd be lucky we got four or 5,000 people. The president normally draws, you know, 12, 15, 20,000 people to these things. I was, I was, it was incredible. I'd never, like I said, I'd never experienced anything like that. You mentioned your work at the White House and I want to, I want to get to that. But before we do that, just from a 
from a state perspective in the state of Texas, uh, uh, Abbott's uh, popularity rating has, has taken a nosedive. I don't know. Ronald Reagan himself couldn't keep up a good uh, popularity rating right now with the COVID stuff, I'm afraid. But where do you, do you see that, um, that rating uh, bottoming out at some point and, and then ticking back up? I mean, he's, he's not up for re-election, so I, I, he's got plenty of time to recover. So, so a couple things. He, was, he had the hot – before the COVID-19 situation, he had the highest approval ratings of any elected official in the state. So when people talk about his ratings falling, they need to remember it was from a very, very high perch. And he was having 68% approval ratings. Well, that means in order to have a rating that high, he's even having some Democrats and independents saying they like him. So it's not unusual, especially as you go into an election season, that – swing voters or even some crossover Democrats that aren't solid Republicans would find reasons to come down. But so, but it has come down some. Uh, my, this is my own personal belief. Uh, first of all, you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. If you, if For those, if you open up um, on one schedule, some people say you go, you're going too fast. You open up on another schedule, people say you, you, you're going too slowly. So it's a very difficult situation. Having said that, how we come out of this, uh, you know, a year from now, if, if we've come out of this and, and the economy's back on track, but then a year from another election, I feel very confident that his numbers will rebound. Talking to Steve Ministeri, former chairman of the Texas Republican Party and uh, also a senior staffer at the White House. Uh, Steve, uh, just keeping on Abbott for a minute, there's been some talk that he would run uh, for the national, you know, for the presidency in 2024. Do you think that's Somewhat likely, possible, possible. What's your take on that? Well, I'm like everybody else. I'd like to know. I, you know, I've asked these folks directly, and they, 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 they say that they're just focused on mm. being governor and being a governor. So you, you can't get that out of them. So, Sounds like a yes to me. <laughs> you know, I, I, I think everybody likes to keep their options open, yeah. and um, I, it, you know, if 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 our choice is to you know, is it John Kasich or Paul Hogan or uh, you know? I, I rather have I rather have Governor Abbott there. Yeah, I, yeah, me as well. Uh, you know, I I guess if I was going to say the top three possibilities or top four personalities, of course, you'd have to start with Mike Pence. You'd have to have uh, Abbott in there. Maybe uh, maybe Rand Paul makes another run at it. Um, Nikki Haley. Anybody else out there in the field you think is is shaping up? Well, there are a lot that are talking about it, uh, it but I, I would agree with you. If you you go to your top couple, you, you, you've hit certainly Mike Pence, certainly Nikki Haley, but then you have a long list of folks that presumably and reportedly are thinking about it. So, for example, Florida has three different people thinking about running for president, their governor, their senator, to both senators, Rubio, Scott, and DeSantis, the governor. So there's three right there. Just to our north, Tom Cotton. Of course, our own Senator Ted Cruz has said that he would like to run for president again. Now, that doesn't mean he's, he's saying he's going to run in 2024. It's just saying he'd like to run for president again. But you, you can't you can't discount that as well. I think Hogan's trying to position himself. Uh, I think he's going to run in a different lane, though. I think he's going to try to run in the in the in the uh, moderate lane. You know, I think Rand having talking with him, I think he'd, you know, He'd like to take another shot, or let me just say, keep it open to take another shot uh, at it. Um, my guess is it's going to be like last time, where we're going to have you know seventeen, eighteen candidates running, and you know it would be interesting if you have three, three Floridians, and let's just say you had. I don't mean to start a, uh, a rumor here. I'm just saying hypothetically. Just say we had two Texans running. Uh, you could have you know five out of it. 18 be te- Texans or Floridians. Yeah, I get your drift. You know, for for a while I was thinking about um, if if another vacancy on the court opens up that the the president would ask Ted Cruz uh, to, um, to 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 join the court. That's probably not likely, though, is it? Given Ted's ambition. Well, I've actually asked the senator because, like, to me, it's the perfect. I mean, to me, it's the perfect choice. I mean, somebody that's popular in the party who's obviously super intelligent. You know, his philosophy is very similar to the philosophy that I'd want to see on the court, and I think most Republicans would be encouraged if he was nominated. I I mentioned that to him once. I said, you know, you'd be the perfect Supreme 
court justice, and I hope he doesn't mind my saying this because uh, it was a private conversation, but it wasn't, I think, anything confidential. He said, having been a clerk at the Supreme Court, he has seen that lifestyle, and it's very isolating. You spend just a lot of time by yourself in your chamber studying briefs. And he said that he felt uh, uh, his calling in life was not that, that his calling in life was going out among people. And he enjoys the rallies, yeah. and he enjoys speaking, and so... Uh, I, I think his preference is to stay in elective office. We're going to keep uh, Steve on for another segment when we go to the break here. And uh, I want to talk to Steve about life in the White House, uh, working around President Trump. We've heard so much uh, good and bad about that. I want to I want to cut down to the bone and, and see what Steve thinks. All right, you're listening to the Chad Hasty Show. We'll be right back after this. Back on the Chad Hasty Show, I'm Matt Crow sitting in for Chad. On the phone, I've got former Republican Party of Texas Chairman Steve Ministeri, and, of course, just recently uh, Deputy Assistant to the President at the White House. And um, Steve's uh, political career, if, if his looks like a coffee can, mine looks like a, a thimble compared to his. He's Not only did he uh, was one of the founders of YCT, but uh, um, worked for people like John Tower and worked Lamar Alexander, Bob Mossbacher was a great guy. Uh, Rand Paul, I mean, uh, goes on and on and on. It'd take two hours to recite the litany of all the campaigns you've worked on. But um, your latest gig, as it were, at the White House uh, was that the first time you'd, you'd been you'd worked at the White House in any administration? Yes, and it was quite an experience, and I didn't know what to. Uh, what to expect, but I would just tell any American, if you ever get a chance to be on a White House staff, even if it's at the lowest rung on the ladder, uh, give up whatever job you're doing, because it's, I mean, every day when you come in, I mean, you're, you're going, you know, you're going into the the residence of the President of the United States, and you'll, you'll look to your right, and there'll be a, a desk from Teddy Roosevelt, and you look to your left and there'll literally be a chest from Ulysses S. Grant and uh, there's a piece of furniture from John Adams. It's the the, sec- the old Secretary of State's library is real. 18 karat gold uh, leafed all over the um, uh, railings. I mean, it's just it, it's it's really pretty heady stuff. You, um, you had the opportunity to work with the president. Now what we read in the newspapers and we see on television portray him as um, Running amok half the time, uh, not listening to anybody, not a thoughtful person, not a not a, even an educated person. Um, you've you've been around uh, politicians your whole career, and uh, you've worked uh, in private practice and business yourself, and uh, have met payrolls and, and have managed folks. What, how would you how would you characterize number one the president's management? Um, ability, not to get too deep into the weeds. And then number two, how people on the White House staff relate to him. So a couple of, a couple of observations. All my life, people have complained that what they don't like about politicians is, are two major things. One, that the person that's put out in public is different from what they see behind the scenes in private that they act very, very nice in public. And then, you know, or you look back at the John Lyndon Johnson tapes or whatever. I mean, it's pretty rough guys. And the second thing, and probably more important thing, and I've heard this throughout my life within the Republican Party, you know, they run on one thing and then they do something else. It just seems so ironic to me that what this president gets criticized for are two things that one, his personality is exactly what you see, exactly what we knew it would be before he got elected, kind of a disruptor to come and shake things up and not accept business as usual and be blunt and not engage in, in, in platitudes. But, you know, if he doesn't like something, he tells you he doesn't like it. And if he likes something, he tells you he likes it. And then the, the thing most ironic is the thing that the people on the left seem to be most upset about, you know, border security, Supporting the police, uh, tax cuts. You know, co- you know. Hopefully, conservative justices on the Supreme Court. That's exactly what he ran on, and so that's my first observation. My second is as to what it's like behind the scenes. 
I, I was delayed getting over there for 23 days because I had to divest myself of some assets. So most of the crew had been already over there. And my first week I was there, I were in our offices, and almost all the offices have televisions playing about four different channels at one time because it's a way you, you keep up with what's going on the outside if somebody asks you a question coming from the outside. But the sound's turned off, and you have the, the, the cryons or the headlines to look at. And I'm sitting in a meeting, and all of a sudden I see breaking news, White House in chaos, White House paralyzed. And then everybody keeps, you know, everybody's just working. And it happens again. And finally, I just stopped. I I think something's happening. <laughs> and they say, oh, no, you know, CNN puts that up every day. Yeah. And, and and really, that's my best way to describe it, describe it because we, we were just all very professional behind the scenes. It's just like a business to go to, you know, we had staff meetings for our department our department, Monday and Friday, once or twice a week, I went to a deputy assistance meeting that was conducted by the deputy chief of staff to get our instructions, and then we go about our business. And, you know, there, there is always some intrigue in the West Wing. I talked to a lot of people there at work in the Reagan and Bush administrations, and they said, you know, every administration, it's like a palace court. Uh, there's always some intrigue. But the way I would describe it to people is that if you've ever – swam in a swimming pool when you're a kid and there's a couple of kids up on the surface and they're having a splash fight but you go and you sit on the bottom of the pool and you look up it's it's very calm every you know you're just looking up a couple of kids splashing each other so you know some people in the west wing may throw a sharp elbow at each other but go back to the time of ronald reagan and remember the mike deaver uh Jim Baker, Ed Meese mm-hmm. intrigues, or the Donald Reagan, Nancy Reagan. You know, it happens in every White House. Mm-hmm. The uh, the press, uh, I, well, my theory about what you're saying is this. The, 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 the first time that President Trump ha- held a rally and from the podium pointed at the press platform 60 feet away and said, you're fake news and you're fake news and your paper's going under and you guys are liars. And you speaking the truth, of course, but they'd never heard that from a sitting president before ever they never heard it to their face if you if you if you listen to the nixon tapes or all right yep some of the writings from kennedy or uh johnson they all said the same things in private they all didn't like the press they didn't like the the uh the bad publicity and they would you know cuss at them in private and then they would be nice to them in public and that was goes to my earlier point the president is just being real. He's saying the same thing in public that he says in private. And it's not like the other presidents haven't said it. They're just duplicitous. They will, they'll say, oh, the press is great in public, and then in private complain about it. Hey, uh, with regards to Trump in Texas, uh, there's been a lot, and again, I'm sorry to use the term again, fake news, but a lot of uh, mishmash in the statesman and the Texas Tribune about how Biden is going to give Trump a run for his money. What, what's the Reader's Digest version of that, Steve? So the Reader's Digest version, for those that remember when I was state chairman, is that I ran 10 years ago saying that this state should be treated as a super swing state, and it wasn't nearly as Republican as people thought. It's just lean Republican. So I'll remind your listeners of a couple things. When I came in as state chairman, Democrats, not Republicans, held 55% of the offices. Republicans only held 2,470 of the uh, 2,000 offices. I'm sorry, 5,463. The legislature was split 76-74. This is a decade ago. And the average Republican in 2008 against the Democrats statewide only got 52.94% of the vote. Because we didn't take it as a... Hey, Steve, that, Steve hold, that, right. hold that thought for a second. We'll get right back to you. I'm back on the Chad Hasty Show with Steve Ministeri, and I know Steve's got to get to work, but Steve, just... In a few minutes, just relate to us why Trump is going to take Texas and this stuff about Biden uh, trying, you know, edging him out is, to me, is is very wishful thinking on the part of the Democrats. The Democrat threat seriously, the president will win the state, but will get us in trouble is if we if we don't recognize the threat. I, I just remind people that the president got 52.2% of the vote in 2016 in Texas. So that's not an overwhelming margin. That was a, a lower margin than he won Iowa 
uh, and barely more than Ohio, which are two swing states. The state is about a Republican plus four or five, so we have a slight advantage. Uh, but we do have an advantage. So all things being equal, we win. But that means we have to we have to turn out. And the Democrats, because they think they can win, that's what will motivate them to work hard. So we need to work hard too. Now here here's the best news. This is what people miss when they talk about the state being Republican or Democrat. That really shouldn't be the issue. The issue is is the state conservative or liberal. And all these same polls that show that this race is a toss-up, every single one of them, if you look at the crosstabs, will show that there's significantly more people in the state, almost by two to one, that say they're, they, they lean conservative than lean liberal, and almost by two to one, uh, and the smallest margin I've ever seen is one and a half to one, uh, there's a group of people that say they're very, very conservative compared to very liberal. So we will win this state if we do two things. One, make people understand that electing Joe Biden is not some sort of benign exercise. You will adopt, and he will bring with him the the left's agenda. Uh, and and two, that we, we have to work and turn out our vote. But if we do that, the president will win the state. Let's end it there. Steve Ministeri, thank you so much. And, uh, Steve, have a great rest of the week. The um – uh, Texas voters appreciate what you've done. Republican Party voters appreciate what you've done for the state of Texas. And I think the president was lucky to have you in the White House. So thanks again. That was Steve Munisteri.